Bible there, would you turn with me to John chapter 17? I'm not going to say that for much longer. This week and next week, next week I'll, uh, we'll end the series here in John 17. And what an appropriate day to end it on Pentecost Sunday. So today we're going to be in just one verse, verse 24. So if you have your Bible there and you're in 17, just look down to verse 24. So the title of this series has been Christ's Great Prayer. Last time, uh, Jesus turned his attention to a new group of people there in verse 20. We talked about that. And then last week, 22 through 23, he continued his prayer for those who believe in him and focused on unity. And we talked about oneness last week and how oneness and glory kind of work together. Today for Mother's Day, I thought we would look at verse 24, just verse 24 today. And, I, you know, we have to ask the question now, what is a mother? A question that no one has ever had to ask in the history of the world. What is a mother? But now because of the judgment of God on Western civilization, and specifically on American culture, we have to address it. Or at least our culture seems to have the need to address it. In our day, uh, our culture has been given over to the reprobate mind, just as Paul wrote in Romans 128. And even as they did not retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. The reprobate mind is demonstrated in many ways. Two years ago, uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson was questioned by the Senate committee reviewing her nomination to the Supreme Court. And in that interview, she was asked if she could provide a definition for a woman. The judge-elect declined to answer, saying she wasn't a biologist. My five-year-old granddaughter is not a biologist either, but she knows the difference between a man and a woman. He'll be glad to tell you what that difference is. So if we're confused about who a woman is, except for five-year-olds, then who a mother is must also be called into question. Gender confusion, identity politics, diversity, equity, and inclusion policies have so blurred the truth about who we are that confusion has even spread into the church. Just last week, the United Methodist Church meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina, united to affirm the entire array of LGBTQ doctrine and to canonize it into their book of discipline, effectively creating a whole new religion. And no one was shocked by this, given the turmoil in that denomination over the past years on this very question. However, what was shocking was the complete rejection of the apostles' doctrine for something man-made. And as I said, they have created an entire new religion that can no longer be called church. They are no longer the body of Christ. They have built something completely out of thin air. So this leads me to the question this week as I'm preparing Mother's Day. And forgive me, moms, that, you know, all this is happening this week. But it leads me to the question, who are we? Who are we? If we're confused about who a woman is, and if we're confused about who a mother is, and if we're confused about what the Bible says about gender identity, who in the world are we as a church? Let's talk about identity here. And so the title of the message today is Our Identity. What does the Bible say about who we are? This identity is more important than any other. So whether you're a mother or a father, a grandmother or a grandfather, a man or a woman, a child or a grandparent, whoever you are in relation uh, to each other, who you are in relation to who Jesus is, is the most important thing. So let's dive into then verse 24. I'll read it and then we'll have a word of prayer before I make my comments. Verse 24, John 17. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. 
Father, we ask today that you would help us as we consider these issues of our identity. Show us, Father, what it is here that Jesus provides for us in this wonderful prayer. We ask, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts today. Father, give me unction as I preach and all of us ears to hear and hearts to receive the goodness of God. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, you'll notice there in verse 24, he says, Father, I will that they also... So he's still in this, he's still in this prayer, and we, we dare not forget, and I'm not going to let myself or you forget, that we are in a prayer. Jesus is praying to his Father, and here he comes to another spot in the prayer where he addresses the Father, just like we would. You know, if we go home this afternoon and we say a prayer, we're going to probably pray, Dear Father, you know, because that's the way Jesus taught us to pray. And, of course, he demonstrates that for us right here in verse 24. Again, he started the prayer that way in verse 1. He's saying it again here in verse 24. And we're going to have it again next week in 25 as he says, O righteous Father. So he says, Father, I will that they also. Well, who is this they that Jesus is talking about? Well, we know exactly who it is, don't we? Because the they that he's talking about is the church. He's, he began with that in verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them which will believe on me through their word. So the they is the church, and we have it, the very first they that he, he gives us is there in verse 20. Those who will believe on me. So here's the first point in our identity. This is, and I have it in my notes, as they number one. They, number one, is found there in verse 20. And you don't need to look anywhere else, really, except here in this one chapter to give us this beautiful identity of the church, who we are, those that believe. The people that Jesus was praying for are believers, the ones who believe in Jesus. You know, after Philip preached to the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, the, and he was preaching from Isaiah 53 there in the chariot. I always love that story. I can just imagine Philip trying to preach as the chariot's going along a bumpy road, you know, and he's, he's reading from the scroll and he's preaching Jesus to this man who's probably seated in the back of the chariot, and, and he's preaching Jesus, and the, and the Ethiopian eunuch says, hey, here's water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip says... If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There is no equivocation on this point. This is number one. Well, who are we? We are those, if we're in the church, we are those who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We trust in him. It's from Acts chapter 8. Point number two, they number two is found also there in verse 20. It says, for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Believers are believers because of the word of God. It is central to who we are. The word of God is essential to our belief, our preaching, our understanding of Christ, and all that we have in him. Just as it was in the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Because there the, the, uh, the eunuch asked Philip and said, I pray of thee, whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So the scripture is central to who we are. It's a part of our identity. Especially as Protestants is a part of our identity. However, there are some Protestants now that just have discarded the word of God wholesale. Just baby in bathwater, just tossed it out. I was, watching a, a, I was watching a presentation by a Methodist pastor, and I thought he was going to you know, decry what happened in Charlotte with the, with the conference there, uh, adopting all that mess that they adopted in Charlotte this past week. But instead, he said, I don't know what we're going to do. He says, because I don't, he says, we never had to think about this before, and I don't know, I don't know where to go to find out what we should do. And I was shocked. I said, well, why don't you just go to the Word of God? Just allow that to be your standard. How about that? Could we just do that? Oh, but he didn't know, and he was going to form a committee and see what the committee thought because he knew there were lots of opinions in the church. <laughs> Who cares what the opinions are in the church? Let's use the Word of God as our standard, as our rule. Let's set it down as the thing that's going to guide us on the path of life. Mm. So that's number two. The they number two is... We are a people 
who are bound to the Word of God because it's the source of all that we know and believe. Number three, verse 21. They also that may they that they also may be one in us. We find it there in verse 21. This oneness in the Godhead, the they are they because of the presence of them in us. How'd you like that? Yeah. The essential part of who we are and the change of nature that we experience is because of the sanctifying presence of God's Spirit within us. His presence provides us with His oneness. Oh, what glory that is. That the very God of heaven who created all things would find it acceptable and pleasing to himself to dwell within us. Oh, friends, we rejoice in that presence, praise him for his nearness and the work of his mediatorial kingship over all things for the church. And you just look at the back of your bulletin today and you'll see something about the mediatorial kingship of Christ for the church, and all that it says there, ladies and gentlemen, is all that we have in Christ. And it's over all things for the church. He oversees all things. We are a people governed by our king. That's who we are. So that's number three. Number four, the fourth thing that tells us about our identity is again there in verse 21. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Believers are a people with a purpose. This is who we are, a grand work to express our faith, to send out the whole word of God to the whole world that God made. Now, that's a big effort, but think about that little group of people there in uh, Madhra Pradesh, India, the little family group that's been born again, and they start a home Bible study, and they invite their neighbors. They're not trying to reach into America or Europe or Africa or Asia or anywhere else. They're just trying to reach those folks around them, and just that little group says, hey, why don't you come over? and We want to study the Bible together. Can you come and join us? And guess what? People are coming, and they're hearing the Word of God taught, and when the Word of God is taught, what happens? Hearts are changed, and a church is growing there because they, their identity is a people who want to share that Jesus has transformed them and can transform their friends as well. Yeah, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. That has been the heartbeat of the church forever. Always sharing, always going, always sowing the seed of God's word. And then he says there in verse 23, which is the verse right before where we are, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them. We not only identify as a people that are sent out, not only as a people that are one with God, not only as a people founded on the word of God, not only as a people who believe in Jesus, those are what we've talked about as identity, our identity, but now we see that we identify as a people who are loved because Jesus tells us so. This is the great contradiction of the ages, isn't it? That God would love us? We are a people loved, and how is it that the love of God is expressed towards us? Well, Paul tells us clearly in Romans chapter 5 when he says, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What a contradiction that he would love sinners and send his son to show his love for sinners by the son dying so that we might have life. Oh, my friends. Can it be possible? Can it be true? Can this thing be so that Jesus would die for me, a hell-bound sinner, under the judgment and condemnation of God? Absolutely. That the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them. And this is the message of love, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him. Now we go right back to the very first thing, don't we? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, my friend, and you will be saved. So, this identity. Jesus said, Father, I will that they, now I wanted to identify the they so we know exactly who those people are, that they, he says, also whom thou hast given me. Now here again, we have the agency of God. My very first message in this series from John 17 was about the agency of God. My first message, I talked about this important doctrine that everything in this prayer is rooted in the action of the Father. 
And here in John 17, 24, we see that even our membership in the they, our membership in the church, our being a part of the body of Christ is because of the action of God. It is holy of God. And you just go to Ephesians chapter 1 and you can read more about that, that wholeness of God's action for us. There in Ephesians 1 verses 4 and 5, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. Do you hear that? According to the good pleasure of his will, whom thou hast given me, God has given us to Christ Jesus out of the good pleasure of his will. And he did it himself. He chose us before the foundation of the world. He's the one that identified us as people who should be holy and without blame before him in love. He predestined us under the adoption of children. God is the one who has done all of this, and he's done it by Jesus Christ according to his good will, and for the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he made us accepted in the beloved. <laughs> I would never have achieved that on my own. I don't know about you, but being accepted in the beloved, no, sir. I would never have been accepted. I would have been rejected out of hand, and they would have been right to reject me and every one of us. But no, God loved us so much. His good will towards us was that we would be a part of this thing called the body of Christ. That is who we are. Not only are we all the things that we talked about there in that first part, but we're also those whom God has given to Christ. Isn't that wonderful? We are a gift. The church is a gift to Christ by God. How beautiful that is. And then he says, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. Be with me where I am. Where is that? Jesus told the disciples that believers have a place in him. You remember John chapter 14? You know I'm going to go there, don't you? Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. Nice. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus wants us to be there. Be with me where I am. And where is he? He's right now in heaven preparing mansions for us. He's preparing a place for us because he wants us there. And one day we will be there with him. Friends, do you know where your where is? You know, we talk about what we're going to do tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next month and the next six months and the next five years and the next ten years. We have all of our plans and we have it all mapped out until we, until we die. But then what's next? Have you planned that part too? Have you planned out what's next? The where that comes after the service? And after the internment, do you know where that is? Because if you don't know that where, friend, your where at that point is darkness. There's no hope there. But if you're in Jesus and you believe in him and you've trusted in him, my friend, there is a hope for after the internment. And it is with him because he wants you to be there with him. He prays that to his father, that they be with me where I am. Are you going to be there? Mm. We, ladies and gentlemen, are mansion dwellers. This is also a part of our identity. We might find ourselves in caves and holes of the earth in this life, wandering from place to place, finding no permanent city, no friendly faces to greet us. However, when he receives the church to himself, then our permanent home will be enjoyed. This is who we are. And our future is filled with something wonderful. Notice what Jesus says there at the end of the verse. That they may behold my glory. Now Jesus showed forth his glory and the glory of God during his life. John records this in chapter 1 of his gospel. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
And then in John chapter 2, uh, and you know, the, the, feast, the wedding feast there in Canaan of Galilee, he says, this is the beginning of miracles. Uh, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. So you see, the, the, the disciples had seen something of the glory of Christ. And there, of course, in John chapter 2, when he turns the water into wine, the whole point of that story was the glorification of Christ and his very first miracle. And it is such a shame that people turn it into some kind of an excuse to drink alcohol. This is not an excuse for you to drink alcohol. This is an excuse for you to glorify Christ. That's what this is an excuse for. Do not turn this into something fleshly and horrible and dark and slimy. It's not about you drinking alcohol. It's about you glorifying Christ for the fact that he could take water and turn it into something different. But I digress. That they may behold my glory. But this wasn't the glory that we will enjoy. Jesus spoke of his glory previously in this chapter. Notice there in verse 5 in chapter 17, in verse 5, he says, And now, Father, now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had before the world was. Now, we talked about that uh, there in the very first part of that chapter. This is that pre-incarnate glory that Christ and the Father had long before anything had been created. And we also see it in Revelation. The Revelator makes it clear what this before glory looks like. There in verse or chapter 1 of the book of Revelation, his head and his hairs were like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were a flame of fire. His feet like undefined brass, as if they burned in a furnace. His voice is the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun that shines in its strength. There's the glory of Christ. Not only that, mm, well, if you'll allow me, let me turn over to Revelation again. Revelation chapter 5, here we go. <clears throat> and I saw the right hand of him that was on the throne, a book written within and on it, the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, weep not, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou, hast, thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us under our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Yes, friends, this is the glory that we will behold. This is what Jesus wants us to see. He wants us to glorify him for all that he is. And we one day will see it when we're there in those mansions and we stand before the throne of God and we see the Lamb take the book out of the hand of God who sits on the throne. Be that day. And then Jesus ends here in verse 24 and says, Which you have given me. All the things that God has given Christ in this chapter, so many. Verse 2, he gave him power. In verse 2 also, he gave him many, as thou hast given the many people that he had been given. The work, he says in verse, in verse 4, he had been given the work by God. The men that you gave me out of the world, there in verse 6. 
Uh, thou gavest them me, also in verse 6. All things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, verse 7. The words which thou gavest me, verse 8. For them which thou hast given me, verse 9. Those that thou hast given me, verse 11. Those that thou hast given me, I have kept, verse 12. The glory which thou gave me, verse 22. They whom thou hast given me, verse 24. And my glory which thou hast given me, in, also in verse 24. Notice all these things that Jesus says that God has given. You cannot read the 17th chapter of John without finding the agency of God almost in every verse. God is doing a work. He is doing a work. And ladies and gentlemen, we're a part of it because six times out of all those mentions that I just made, it's about the people that God had given Jesus. It's about us, the church. The many, the men, the them, the those, the they, all of them, all of that group. It's the, it's the church. And Jesus says that God has given them to him. For thou lovest me. This is why God gave them to him. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Now we often talk about how much he loves us. And that's a good thing to talk about. You know when Paul writes there that God commends his love towards us. And that while we're yet sinners Christ died for us. Friends. That's wonderful, but there's also the, a love that he shows for Christ. And there is no love for us unless there is first a love for Christ. And this is the covenant that has been made between the Father and the Son before the world was. Before anything happened, before any of us ever existed, before any of that took place, before Jesus framed the worlds with his words, no before that, God and the Son, the Father and Son, made a covenant together. And this word love is a covenant word. And they made a covenant so that there might be a people that God might show his love towards through Christ Jesus. Because he loved him, he now loves us. The before statements are featured prominently in this prayer. The first one, he says there in verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. This tells us about the pre-incarnate Christ and his glory and eternal existence. But the second one that we have here in verse 24 describes the covenant made for the salvation of the elect. In John chapter 10, verse 17 John describes this, uh, this theme of the love of God for Christ Jesus in several places. One is in John 10, 17. Another is in John 15, 9 through 10. Jesus told his disciples about the Father's love for him. He says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. There's that covenant that they had made together. And then in 10... In 15, verse 9, as the Father hath loved me, there it is again, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Yes, the love of God for us is wonderful, but it begins with his love for Christ and the plan that they made together to save men and women, boys and girls, so that there might be a new people called the church. So how do we apply this 24th verse, moms and dads? Well, number one, we're talking about our identification. We are believers in Jesus Christ. We trust in him according to his word. Number two, we are keepers of his word. We have no other foundation, station, religion, truth, ethic in which to order our life. For the commandment is a lamp and the light is law and the law is a light and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Number three, we are united in Christ and in his word. Our oneness with the Father and the Son, beautified by the presence of his spirit. Number four, we are sent out to make him known that the world may believe. Number five, we are ambassadors of God's grace. Just as Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Now then, ye are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. This is the church's mission to make this proclamation. Be ye reconciled to God. We are mansion dwellers. And we are glory beholders. You know, this past week the, we had the northern lights that reached all the way down here to Cincinnati. Denise and I looked and looked and looked. We never did get to see them. 
But my son in central middle Tennessee had a party at his house, and on the hillside of his home, they had a beautiful display of the glory of those golden blue and red and green lights as they danced across the sky in middle Tennessee. But my friends, we're going to behold something better than northern lights one day. We're going to behold the glory of Christ in all of its fullness. What a day that will be. But will you be there? Will you be there? Let's, let's bow for prayer. Oh, Father, help us to be there. Help us to be there when it is time. Lord, that uh, we might give ourselves completely to you. We thank you for this identification that you give us. We know who we are. We know what we're about. We know what we believe. We thank you for that. We thank you for Jesus and all that he's given us. Oh, what glory, what wonder, what grace, what great goodness and mercy he has, he has demonstrated towards us. Father, that you would help us today. Fill us with the fullness of your presence, especially for the moms that are gathered here this day. Bless us today, Father, with these things. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.